So this is the last and 11th sermon in our fall sermon series called Rockstar, the David Saga. The story I'm about to read actually happens fairly early in David's career as Israel's king, but this is the story I wanted us to hear four days before Thanksgiving. This is from 2 Samuel ch chapter 6. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, David sacrificed an ox. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. David returned to bless his household, but Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself before the eyes of his maidservants, as any vulgar fellow might do. But David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to appoint me as prince that I have danced before the Lord. And I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in my own eyes. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, who do you think is the most compelling, vivid, three-dimensional protagonist in all of Western literature? I had fun compiling this catalog. Maybe you will, too. Homer's given us Achilles and Odysseus, and they're certainly promising candidates. History has given us Caesar Augustus and Charlemagne and Abraham Lincoln. And I would buy that too. King Arthur or Lancelot or Galahad. One of my personal favorites is Jean Valjean from Les Miserables. And we'd have to consider Alyosha from the brothers Karamazov. Tolkien's Aragorn, King of Gondor, belongs in that company. I was kind of surprised to survey the works of Shakespeare and discover that not a single Shakespeare character falls into that company of compelling, attractive protagonists. Henry V, maybe. Yale scholar Harold Bloom says that the most charismatic protagonist in Western literature is Israel's King David, better and bigger than Odysseus and Arthur. And I, ho I hope I've convinced you in this sermon series that Dr. Bloom has a good point. And part of it, of course, is the comprehensive scope of David's competencies and personality. He was shepherd boy, rock star, giant slayer, warrior, outlaw, hero, sinner, father. He played all these roles for his family and for his people. Now, there are a lot of great reasons to be a Christian, but among the leading reasons is that we have the best book. We're just borrowing it from our Jewish friends, but we have the best book. It has one of the greatest novellas in all of literature, this David saga, which sprawls across three books of the Hebrew Bible. The David saga is as entertaining as Game of Thrones. The David saga is a Game of Thrones. But it's not just the encyclopedic scope of David's personality. It's also his irrepressible joie de vivre, yes? It is as if in David, human life itself is unchained to caper where it will. David's life is just saturated in unending doxology. Not only those 73 top 40 hits he wrote for the Hebrew Psalter, but this little dance he cavorts before the Ark of the Covenant. Someone once described the Dutch-Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza as ein Gott betrunken Mensch. Ein Gott betrunken Mensch, a God-intoxicated man. And that's the way I think about King David, a God-intoxicated man. You see what's happening in the story I read a moment ago, right? The Ark of the Covenant was the Hebrews' most precious, sacred, religious relic. It was the earthly throne of the Almighty and stood for God's near presence with God's people. 
And so that if the ark were gone, in some sense it meant that God was gone as well. And if you want to know what the ark meant to ancient Israel, you could do worse than going to see that movie once again, uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's actually not bad theology. Anyway, through a series of misadventures we can't really get into this morning, the ark had been lost to Israel, captured by Israel's enemies, the Philistines, and then recaptured by the Hebrews, but then stored in an ugly warehouse for 20 years. So the ark's been gone for 20 years, and in some sense also, therefore, God's been gone too. It would be like if the Russians snuck into the archives in Washington, D.C., and made off with the original copy of the U.S. Constitution. And then we managed to sneak back into the Kremlin to get it back, but then put it behind the garage doors of one of those mini self-storage units for, for 20 years. That's what's going on with the Ark of the Covenant. And David is the one to finally rectify this monumental oversight after 20 years. And he's just so happy to have the Ark back where it belongs that he, he breaks into this frisky little romp of a dance. He strips down to his skivvies and cavorts for all, can you see this in your mind? The king of Israel, the president of the United States in his shorts, dancing down the streets of the capital. The people are stunned, but then they go wild with glee. They have never seen a king do this before, and they never will again. But they love it. Everybody loves it. All Israel loves David's little dance, except his wife, Queen Michael, daughter of Saul, now David's wife, in the palace, in the balcony on the second floor, overlooking the streets of Jerusalem. She is above this, literally and otherwise. She is too hoity-toity to be a part of this shenanigan. And when David comes home after his little jig, Queen Michael greets him with dripping sarcasm. How the king of Israel honored himself today before his maid servants uncovering himself as any vulgar fellow might do. But David, of course, is not embarrassed because he's done this for the Lord. His life is unending doxology. And he says to his wife, Queen Michael, I will abase my set myself yet more for the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible for God. And then, of course, that terse, sad little coda to the story and Saul's daughter, Queen Michael, had no children till the day of her death. No explanation, just the brutal historical fact. So what happened? Did King David banish Queen Michael from his bed for her insolence? Did Queen Michael refuse to, to sleep with such a tacky king? Did God close Michael's womb for being opposed to his favorite, King David? Who knows, whatever, no son of Michael will ever inherit David's throne. And Michael is the second and last of the short Saul dynasty. Now, my Sunday school teachers in western Michigan, among the conservative Dutch reform, never paid much attention to this story. There were three worldly activities that were banished from our Dutch reformed kingdom. Movies, card playing, and dancing. The, these were symbolic of rampant secularism. And so we had no truck with Hollywood or Pinochle or the twist. And we were so sure about this that we might have gotten our priorities a little mixed up. We told a little joke about ourselves that maybe I've shared with you before. Why are the Dutch Reformed opposed to premarital sex? Because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> but we, we might have gotten this all wrong. <laughs> Jürgen Moltmann is one of the two greatest living Christian theologians. He's German, of course. Jürgen Moltmann says, the universe belongs to the dancer. The person who does not dance does not know what's coming to pass. And you see what he means, yes? History is God's story, and present appearances notwithstanding what is coming to pass is a joy beyond the walls of this world more poignant than grief. And so I thought that was the story we needed to hear four days before Thanksgiving in this grim season. California is burning. 1,000 are missing. The European Union is falling apart. Genocide in Yemen. Unscrupulous autocrats rule Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and North Korea. Crazy haters keep shooting roomfuls of Jews and college students. 
the word apocalyptic kept springing into my mind unbidden. A while back, the satirical, satirical journal The Onion posted a photograph of a conference room full of journalists and reporters and editors and producers, and they're sitting around a conference table gesticulating and arguing, and the accompanying headline reads like this, CNN holds morning meeting to decide what viewers should panic about for rest of day. And it seems in a time like this almost irrational or at least unfashionable to practice hope and joy, to believe in God's good ending for our world. I love the novels of Peter de Vries. Peter died 25 years ago, but for 40 years before that, he was on the staff of The New Yorker. He was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, part of one of those waste management Dutch families. His family made their living collecting the streets off the trash off the streets of South Chicago. He is probably the second most famous alumni, alumnus of my uh, alma mater, Calvin College, and might be the funniest American writer between Mark Twain and David Sedaris. But he could be serious too, and in one of his novels, Mr. DeVries tells of a young man who is cynic, who's a cynic because it's chic. His greatest joy in life is to chip holes in the simple trust and faith of other people, especially the religious faith of his parents. And he gets splitting headaches whenever he has to look at another human being. The young man can't hold a job, but he's supposed to be writing a play about the meaninglessness of the universe. About him, people say, my, my, he must be so brilliant, he hates everything. And when his mother asks him why he never goes to church, the young man says, because there's no God and there's no good, obviously. The whole thing is a joke. The life, the universe, it's all just a joke. And his mother says to the young man, is that why you never laugh? And so we, we can laugh because the universe is not a joke. History is God's story with a fairy tale ending. Whenever I get disconsolate over the state of the world, I consult Steven Pinker. Do you know the research of Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker? In 2011, he wrote a, a wonderful, if controversial, book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, uh, where he argues that we don't appreciate what a privilege it is to be alive in our own day. Bill Gates says that this is his favorite book of all time. If I don't have time to read the book, I just consult Steven Pinker's TED Talk. Dr. Pinker points out that nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. You should never compare the bleeding headlines of the present with rose-tinted images of the past. He says you never hear a journalist saying, this is Lester Holt reporting from a country that's been at peace for 40 years. You never read this headline. Yesterday, 137,000 people escaped extreme poverty, as every day for the last 40 years, 1.25 billion people. He points out that for much of human history, life expectancy was about 30 years, and now it's 70 around the world and 80 in countries like ours. For much of human history, even in the richest countries, one-third of children would never see their fifth birthday. Now that figure is 6%, even in the poorest countries. 200 years ago, 15% of Europeans could read. Today, the literacy rate is over 90% for those who are under 25. In the last 100 years, the chance of dying in an auto accident has declined 96%. In a plane crash, 99%. Hope and joy might be unfashionable, but they are not irrational. There are so many reasons to praise God for this beautiful world. How they cut loose together, writes Frederick Buechner, how they cut loose together, Yahweh and David, whirling around before the ark in such a passion that they caught fire from each other and blazed up in a single flame of such magnificence that not even the dressing down David got from Michael afterward could dim the glory of it. This unrestrained doxology is what I choose to practice this week. 
all the time. So I'll be thankful for tables burdened with plenty and surrounded with the people I love and who improbably love me back as hard as that is. I will be thankful for the mighty Wolverines and hold my breath on Saturday. <laughs> I will be thankful for the bittersweet melancholy of gray November days and haunting winter winds and the apparently lifeless unleafed trees just waiting for new life next spring and for those somnolent wheat fields of broken stalks which will bring us our bread next year. Be thankful for Starbucks and Mondavi, which let me taste the heat of the sun and the loam of the soil and, soil and that distilled essence. I'll be thankful for rainbows above the rain and more on the domes of deep seashells, for the laser look in the eye of my cat, and for my dog's loyal, sad, soft eyes. And I'll be thankful for the marine fragrance of Lake Michigan when a north wind hurls her curling swells against the pebbles on the beach. And as they clack together, they say, Christ is king, Christ is king. Can you hear the rocks clapping their hands? Christ is king. Praise, praise. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.